It's starting to record. Share screen. I'm going to broadcast now. And our attendees are climbing in. Welcome, 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 everyone. Good morning. My name is Evan Cutts. I'm the content editor for Color Magazine. I'm so excited to invite you all to Color Conversations in partnership with WMFDP for our discussion, Reflecting on Race, Moving Forward for Inclusion and Success. We have an incredible program for you all today, and we're so, so excited to have you here. Uh, I would just like to take a moment to tell you a little bit about myself. As I mentioned, I'm the content editor for Color Magazine, so I oversee our web editing processes, and I also have my hands on a little bit of everything. I also have the honor of being your MC for today's event, um, and we're gonna go through a little bit of some housekeeping. As you can see, we're moving through the slides. Uh, you know, and we'll bring ourselves back to our social media pages towards the end, so you can make sure to follow both Color Magazine and WMFDP. Uh, but as far as housekeeping goes, we would just like to ask you to be present and try to avoid distractions. Um, we also want to let you know that this webinar will be recorded. Um, so after the event, you will be able to revisit and relive all the exciting moments. Um, there will also be at the, uh, for the last half hour of the program, a Q&A section um, where you can pose your questions in the Q&A box, which you should see on the uh, bottom left side of your screen. Um, and we'll be able to present those <clears throat> questions to the participants um, and our panelists today. So feel free to ask your questions as they come up and uh, we'll make sure to set some time aside near the end of the program for you to, uh, to engage with our panelists. Um, I saw a question in the chat. Will we be sending out the recording to the participants following the session? Uh, yes, we will be distributing a link uh, to participa uh, participants and it will also be available on the Color Magazine website. Um, so yes, you will be able to uh, check this out again. Awesome, great question. Okay, moving right along, I would like to introduce our opening remarks speaker and our fearless leader, Camilla Avant. She works as the Director of Diversity Programs and has been leading color into this new age of digital exploration for our events and programming. So please, without further ado, welcome Camilla Avant to the virtual stage. Good morning and good early morning to those in our audience from the West Coast. Um, welcome to our joint virtual discussion with our partner, White Men as Full Diversity Partners, WMFDP, as we reflect on race and drive to move forward in this current climate to inclusion success. Color is continuing to focus its events on issues affecting professionals of color and lifting up diverse voices. I do personally believe that collaborations and partnerships are of extreme importance during this turbulent time in our history. We as individuals and organizations collectively must focus on addressing race and equity, and most importantly, put in actionable work to build bridges and advance diversity initiatives. Color is excited to stand together with WMFDP and support its work as it works across cultures to transform leaders of powerful global organizations. I would now like to welcome to the virtual stage Jim Morris, WMFDP's VP of Client Experience, Mark your words. Thanks, Camilla, and thanks so much for um, partnering with us for this event. And we're really honored and appreciative of being here and to our panelists for joining us. Um, WMFDP, real quickly, is a professional services organization that works on the concept of leadership through the lens of inclusion, equity, and diversity. And we see it as part of our role is to help uh, develop courageous leaders and, and help them expand their consciousness, competence, and courage in the way that they work and in, work to build inclusion, inclusion in their organizations. And the most specifically, particularly in these times, to really look at and understand more about white leaders' role in the elimination of racism in the workplace. So we're excited to be part of this chat today, and I'm looking forward to it. Thanks. So uh, with that, I'll pass to Dr. Sandra Casey Buford, who will be our moderator for the session. Thank you. Sandra, you're on mute. There we go. Good morning and welcome to today's webinar. 
I'm Sandra Casey Buford, and I have over 20 years of experience working in DBNI and uh, in Fortune 500 companies, both in the US and around the globe. Now, as a thought leader, researcher, and practitioner, I'm excited to moderate this panel of experts. Joining me are a roster of seasoned panelists who are poised and ready to share their knowledge and experiences with you during today's session. Now, this is a momentous day, so I invite you to be an active listener and participant in today's program. Make note of your questions as the conversation progresses, and we will try to address as many as we can during the Q&A session at the, at the end of the program. Now, as the conversation develops, Here's just a tip on how you might um, organize your notes. First of all, you're gonna hear expressions and insights on our current situation. Uh, you're gonna hear insights into the ongoing core work of DNI. And you're also going to hear highlights of some of the new work that's in response to emerging challenges that are facing organizations. And you're also going to hear exploration, exploratory ideas and thought leadership on the future of DEI in organizations. Now, at this time, I'm going to ask each panelist to briefly introduce themselves before we launch this dynamic conversation. So, I'd like to uh, move to uh, Jan once again. If you could just give us a just brief overview of who you are. Again, I'm Jim Morris, and I'm the director of, uh, or the vice president of client experience for WMFTP, which means I help manage the, prof the professional services side of our organization in the way that we provide work to our clients. And Mark? Yeah, so my name is Mark Sellers. I'm the associate lab director uh, for the Mission Assurance Division at Sandia National Labs. Um, I'm also a champion for diversity and inclusion, our ambassador group, and the executive champion for our Asian Leadership and Outreach Committee, which is one of our employee resource groups. I, I don't claim to be an expert. I've, I've only been advocating strongly for about three and a half years since I, since I entered this role. Um, but I've come to believe that to make real change here, uh, we have to engage the majority and dominant population to drive change. And so I've learned enough to recognize some of my own privileges that I have and the responsibility and obligation to use those privileges as a voice for change. And so that's what I'm doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And I'd like to move to Tanya. Yes, good morning. And thank you for having me as a part of the panel. I've been in healthcare probably for over 30 years. Um, I am one of the executive vice presidents at Novant Health, and I'm the chief diversity, inclusion, and equity officer, and I'm glad to be here. Thank you, and Susan. Hey everybody, I'm Susan Schmidt Winchester, and I am excited to be here as well. I have a 32 year career in human resources, working primarily in Fortune 500 companies and most recently over the last 13 years as the chief HR officer, currently serving for uh, an amazing company, Applied Materials. And uh, like Mark's comment, I feel like I'm an expert in what doesn't work, even more so than what does work. And uh, I've, had, I've got a lot of um, uh, stories along this journey. I've been working on the, the work of diversity, inclusion, and equity for about 20 years, and uh, very much looking forward to sharing some thoughts. Thank you very much. And again, I'd like to thank you all for stepping up and serving as a panelist in this vital and timely conversation. Uh, this is truly a momentous day. Now, to get started, let's just look at the whole picture of what's going on today. We're living in unprecedented times. COVID-19 and our current racial climate sketches and paints a new and in many ways, uncharted landscape for DEI professionals and practitioners. So I'd like to throw this out to everyone in the panel, just 
you know, think about and share with us um, in this environment of unprecedented uh, pandemic and racial accord, discord, how is your company driving DEI uh, initiatives? How are you addressing it just in a broad brush perspective? And I'm throwing that out to anyone on the panel. I'll, I'll start. Um, this is Tyson. okay. Um, what we're finding is that diversity, inclusion, and equity for us is more important now than ever. Um, we're a healthcare organization and we're in a pandemic. Um, so there's the pandemic in, in, on top of the social that have been occurring. And one of the things that we realize is that um, is people really pay attention to how you care for them, whether you're in healthcare or not. They pay attention to how you're taking care of your team members, we call our employees team members, um, and our patients, and then connecting to our community at large. So we've done a lot of different things. Um, one thing that I learned when I um, started in this role, on my listening tour, is that people wanted to have a safe space to talk. They wanted to know that we were interested in what was happening to them in their communities, um, like the George Floyd incident and others that have occurred. <coughs> So we've created a safe space by having Zoom chats or Zoom dialogues. Um, they've been titled Healing the Soul of Our Community, um, Courageous Conversations. They focus on systemic racism. And while these chats have not been about solving the problems or having debates, it's really been about having people to have their voices heard and also for people to have an opportunity to understand different perspectives. So we have found that that's been very helpful in the organization to be able to start our souls in the community and internally. Thank you so much, Tanya. And anyone else want to add to that, Susan? Yeah, I'll go ahead and jump in there too. I, I really appreciate the comments that Tanya made. And I, you know, our company has a strong commitment to diversity and inclusion and designing an intentional culture of inclusion, which was already underway. And I think that all the things that have been happening in our country relative to racial injustice, a series of, of events, you know, with George Floyd's murder being extremely upsetting and disturbing. And in, in many respects, given the, the negative things that are happening, I think it's been a, a catalyst for uh, attention on work that's already underway. And I'm, I'm incredibly proud our, our CEO, himself did a very personal message out to our global employees. And the message was a personal commitment, not only for himself, but for the company of standing against racial injustice. It was a very strong statement. And what was fascinating to me was the response from our global colleagues all over the world, taking the message, our standing against racial injustice as a, a, a strong statement of our company's position. It goes completely contrary to our entire talent strategy of how do you find and bring in and keep the very best talent and design a culture of inclusion that's good for everybody. And watching our colleagues all over the world translating it into local language and posting it on their own websites and the number of employees that responded globally because it's a global issue. Racial injustice is happening all over the world and it starts right here in the United States. And so not only making public statements, but following through with specific, even stronger statements of action. And to the point of the dialogue, the research shows that being able to create safe spaces for people to talk about what's happening, the impact on lives that are being affected by our Black and African American colleagues being able to share. We've had a number of conversations, amazing partnership and sponsorship with white men allies in our company really driving discussions as executive sponsors for some of our teams. What I'm really proud of is the, the company stepping up. Our CEO just recently signed the CEO Action for Diversity and Inclusion, as well as Catalyst CEO Action for Change. And so I love that uh, the, the personal commitment that's being made by the executives, uh, starting with our CEO, 
completely supported and driven by our board of directors to let our people know that that we we are completely against it and we are taking proactive actions i won't go through all the actions right now we'll talk about that more when we get into strategies that really work uh, but those are some of the things that we're doing related to the current events and covid complicates everything uh, but in some respects the silver lining of covid is that we're able to come together quickly virtually with people all over the world and so i see a strengthening of communities talking about real issues that often in companies we we shy away from thank you very much susan you know i'm interested because um there's a, a lot of companies did come out with a public facing statement i'd like to hear from others on the panel um did did your companies make a public facing statement in the face of either or both COVID and uh, the uh, Black Lives Matter? Um, besides Susan, did any other companies do that? I can answer it. Yes, Novon Health did. Um, we, and I'm gonna just, it's not very long, so I wanna take a minute, if it's okay, Sandra, to read it. Absolutely. Yes, it says, and I'll try to channel our president and CEO who reads this so passionately, uh, but it says, we are Novon Health. We exist to save lives, all lives. We believe black lives matter, period. In the midst of a pandemic, the epidemic of racism has once again shaken us all. We call for empathy, compassion, zero tolerance of racism. We heal bodies every day, but we know only through social justice can we heal the souls of our communities. Because if society isn't healthy, no one is healthy. And I will tell you that resonated with our team members. It resonated throughout our community um, about, it, it resonated with people in that we truly were being true to who we say we are through our journey over these, over about a decade of embedding diversity, inclusion, and equity. We were really true to what we were saying. This was a strong position to take because we had a lot of dialogue about should we put Black Lives Matter in that? And we as an organization and executive team said, absolutely. And it is because Black Lives Matter. Um, so we had lots of people who embraced it, but we also had some of our white colleagues who did not like that Black Lives Matter um, was in that. There was a feeling that all lives matter. And we did actually say that, but we called out that Black Lives Matter. Thank you very much. Um, just uh, as an observation in general, a lot of the public, when they see these public facing um, statements, there's also an expectation that it's not just a statement, that it is something that is going to be acted on and people are going to be looking for tangible results. Anyone wanna just expound on that just a bit? I think that both Tanya and Susan have demonstrated that there have been some positive results as a, as a, a result of their statement. But uh, may I hear from others on the panel about either their feelings about it or their experiences. And I'm now I'm having you to take a look at public facing statements that were made in response to both the pandemic and racial injustice. Hey Sandra, I'll make a couple comments. So, thank you, thank you so um, much. Our organization as a national laboratory is not so much a public facing organization. So, our statements were primarily um, driven internally to our employee population, which is on the order of 15,000 people or so. Um, but basically, we had statements cascading down from individual leaders from our laboratory's director all the way down through. Uh, the different levels of management. And one of the interesting things that we saw is there's, a, there's an awareness and an awakening that's occurring. So we had managers reaching out for the first time indicating, I'd like, to, I'd like to say something, I'd like to talk about this, but I don't know, I don't know how to do that and what's the best way. And um, those individuals were able to, for the first time, uh, reach out and communicate with their organizations in a positive way about the current um, the current situation and working toward helping to resolve the, the problem. 
Thank you very much. And you know, you mentioned something, um, and I'm going to throw this out to everyone, because uh, many of the leaders in the organization, obviously, are, uh, uh, in some cases, the majority are white. And um, so what advice do you have uh, for uh, white leaders or insiders to help them to push past feelings of being uncomfortable dealing with the topic of racial diversity. Does anyone have any advice for how organizations can address that and engage that in their organizations? And I see you smiling, Jim. Do you want to go? I'll go, but I can tell Susan smiling too. So I'll share <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we may be uh, we may be I'll, coming at the, the same topic from a different direction. Uh, I'll come at uh, go ahead, you go for it, and I'll come behind you. Absolutely. Okay, perfect. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it's a really good question, Sandra. I remember uh, earlier in my career, I was uh, uh, working as a head of HR on a, a team that was running a four billion dollar business. It was myself and and nine white men, from different countries, but nine white men, and I felt like you know. The team had the right intentions. They, they wanted to, to affect positive change related to diversity and inclusion. But what I noticed was the more I was trying to figure out what it was that wasn't working, that was part of my issue. I thought it was my job to figure that out. I felt like all the different groups, you know, um, African-American, Hispanic, Asian, LGBT, women, all the <laughs> groups were sort of over here. And then all the white men were over here. And not really sure what they were doing wrong, wanting to do something differently, but unclear what it was that they needed to do. And it felt like the more the company was doing, it was actually creating a bigger and bigger divide. And so the frustration and um, disappointment of not feeling like there was an equal playing ground for advancement and development over here, and this underlying judgment that something was happening and the white men standing over here, always on the outside. And it, and it wasn't until, it was, wasn't until White Men as Full Diversity Partners Insights, I brought them into this company many years ago, that we started to unravel a really basic principle that I never understood. And when I say it, it's gonna seem so obvious. I'm not sure why we haven't all figured it out. But the fundamental issue that was unclear and why there was this tension happening and occurring across these groups is that white men don't think of themselves as being in a group. They think of themselves as being individuals. And they think about their own careers, that they've overcome challenges, obstacles, problems, loss, et cetera. And they are where they are today in their career because of themselves. They pulled themselves up by the bootstraps. They've overcome challenges and difficulties. And, and, and when I say that to my white male colleagues, they almost always say, yeah, that's exactly right. But the piece that was the big insight here in terms of starting to bring in the partnership was the realization that white men are individuals and they are also part of a group. And that group is known as the insider group. I've heard it referred to as the dominant group. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's a statement of realization that they are in a group. And that group, the insider group, has access to power and privilege that is not automatically extended to those of us that are not in the group. And so as Bill Proudman, the, the founder of White Men School Diversity Partners says, it's, it's like the men are in the fish in the water. They don't realize they're swimming around in the water. They just assume everyone's having a similar experience, which is in fact, not the case at all. And so for me, the very first step in bringing together partnership and allyship, whatever you want to call it, and working across driving out systemic barriers to inclusion, it has, to be, it has to be led by the insider group. That's the only way you drive systemic cultural change. And the only way you get there is by starting to understand these insights about how do you leverage the privilege in honorable ways, recognizing mm -hmm. that the privilege is extended simply because of your birthright and that there is a responsibility that comes with that. And to do this in a really non-judgmental, productive way, which is what my experience has been now in three companies and with White Men as Full Diversity Partners, starts to unlock the ability to start partnering together, start, start realizing that in many cases, we're all starting from a place of unconscious incompetence. And that until you start to realize that these dynamics, the insider-outsider group dynamics are happening all over the place, 
You can't, you got to understand that before you can move from unconscious incompetence into mm -hmm. conscious incompetence. But then you're at least on the journey towards uh, understanding what we can do together. So I could go on and on, but Jim, I want to hear your thoughts on that too. Uh, and I'll keep mine brief, Sandra, but um, just uh, thanks, Susan. I, here's, here's what I would say in the current context is important about what Susan was just saying is, you know, we don't want, we, in, in this case, the two of us, Mark and Jim on the screen here, we, don't, we, we frequently have been held back from action because we don't want to do something wrong. We don't want to be called racist, even though most of us, as a result of our upbringing, probably have a lot of racist stuff baked into us. We don't want to be called a white supremacist because we don't think that we're doing that. We don't mean to do that. We're trying to do something better. So we're careful about whatever we do. We're kind of walking on eggshells. And that prevents us from taking action, right? We're afraid to go into a situation and say, gosh, I'm, I'm noticing what's happening in the world with Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and Amon Aubrey and even Amy Cooper. And I'm not, I want to be a support here and I'm not quite sure what to do. So instead of taking action, we ask everybody else to tell us what to do, which then over, we, we just continue to over rely on, you know, our colleagues who are black, brown, indigenous people of color, instead of just saying, well, you know, here's something I know we can do. We got to start somewhere and it's going to be messy and it's not going to be perfect. And we've got to develop the resilience and the sturdiness to, you know, take action and occasionally still be corrected. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, it's not the end of the world when that happens. So that's what I noticed. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tanya, please. Oh, I was just gonna add, um, to piggyback on what Jim was saying and Susan, um, one of the things that, that we did in our courageous um, spaces, or our, our safe spaces in our courageous conversations, we had people to get to each other someone that's different than them. And whether that was a different gender, born outside of the US, born in the US. And we, um, we had them actually do that as some homework from one of the sessions. But also we had a, a couplet do it. It was an African American who was Muslim and uh, someone who was Latino, had them do it kind of in front of everyone so they could model how do you get to know someone different than you. And one of the things that they talked about and we've learned is that um, what you were saying, Jim, you have to first acknowledge that you do have your own biases and preconceived ideas about the other person. Um, and we tend to, all of us, I think I, I'll say for myself, if you don't acknowledge your own biases and you have, there's some that are unconscious and you don't know what they are, but you do have some conscious biases. I do. And so I am, part of it is first to acknowledge that and then to explore them. So as you're getting to know someone else, explore them. And I always tell people, you go first. If you want to know about someone else, you go first and start talking about yourself. And that will open the door for the other person to also share. Thank you so much. Now, this is interesting because it brings us to um, a, an interesting place in this conversation. And that is that every one of us who uh, does work in the diversity space, we have to do our own work first. Does everyone agree with me? Definitely. We have to do our hundred percent first. And yes. it's interesting because that often reveals or raises some natural tensions between the work that we need to do for ourselves and the work that we are trying to uh, promote and engage in and motivate in the organization with other individuals. So I'm going to ask you uh, a very personal question right now. Um, wh what are some of those tensions that arise with ourselves as leaders in the space of diversity and inclusion that we really need to work on even before we begin to uh, work in the diversity and inclusion space and organizations? Does anyone want to comment on that? Please. Yeah, I can comment on that. As I said, all those years of doing this work, I, I felt like I was doing all the wrong things for a long time. And so what do I mean by that? I never understood this dynamic between insider-outsider groups. And when companies aren't talking about this, what goes unstated is a subtle expectation that everybody should assimilate into the dominant group. And so for years, as you know, the only woman, the only white woman on leadership teams, I didn't realize how unconscious I was to trying to be one of the guys. 
And in other words, you know, trying to fit in by being something I am not. And, you know, things like the team that I worked with this, you know, this is three companies ago, they had a practice that they like to go and golf. You know, we go to an offsite meeting, meet, go golfing, dinner, whatever. And I hate, I hate golf. I absolutely hate golf, but I tried to learn golf. I would smoke cigars on the golf course because I wanted them to think I was, you know, one of the guys. And so there was this unconscious um, belief that I had that, that I was unaware of how much it was influencing how I showed up at work. All that effort, discretionary effort that was spent doing something that was completely a waste of time in terms of my ability to be effective and be who I am. I am never going to be a guy. I happen to be a woman and I have different views on things and I'm going to have different perspectives and different insights. But the, I, I, that, that aha of realizing through the work of understanding this, this um, subtlety that you know, when we're coaching people, we're coaching them how to be a lot more like men. We're, to, we're coaching them how to be successful in terms of trying to fix the women. And I was part of that. I was part of that process. So that was a major, major aha. And the other aha that I'll share was for so many years, I thought it was my job, HR's job, to fix the company on d &I issues. And the executives looked at me to say, well, Susan, what's wrong? What do we need to do? I spent I can't even tell you how many, how many months and hours and analysis and, you know, frustration and feeling like I had to come up with the solution and that it was somehow my job to fix the men that I was working with. And what, what a, a completely wrong belief that that was, that, that belief that it was my job to, to fix the DNI issue in the company. Um, you know, th those were, th those, those were the beliefs that I had. They were totally unconscious. They were significantly influencing how I showed up in doing this work. And frankly, I think most of that was working against me and my ability to influence the organization. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'd like to hear from any of the other panelists yeah. who want to talk about their personal journeys, um, uh, just dealing with themselves and, and readying themselves to do this work complex and emotional work in organizations. Yeah. Anyone else can I hear from? Yeah, one thing that I, yeah, Sandra, one thing that I'd share is um, something that Jim and his team have taught about the paradox of supporting and challenging is that, um, yeah, I, I am an African American woman. That wasn't the reason I was uh, asked to be in this role. But one of the things that I um, have, have learned, have seen for me is that when we're talking about um, issues that are connected to African Americans, and one that I'll talk about is how do we look at workforce representation and make sure that our workforce reflects the communities that we serve. So we've looked at all that information. We want to really close the gaps so that we can reflect the communities that we serve. And so when I hear things like, um, but Tanya, you know, we want to really hire the most talented people. Do we hire somebody who's African American just because they're African American? Because we really want to get the most talented. Well, I'm standing there and thinking, okay, I am African American. I believe I'm talented. I've been the president of two of our hospitals. So for me, um, I have to, that tension is really kind of really seeking to understand what they were really saying, really asking questions. So it's supporting where they are in their thought process, but also challenging what they're saying. And, and acknowledging that that's a trigger for me. So when I, when, that, when I feel those triggers, I have to pause so that I can really kind of reset, level set my brain and say, okay, your job here is really to seek understanding and to listen to what they're saying so that you can support and challenge at the same time. Yes, very much. Thank you so much. Now I'm gonna um, flip it a little bit because we've talked about what's happening currently and we're talking a little bit about some of the tensions, the emotional self-awareness work that even DNI practitioners and thought leaders need to do. But right now, I'd like to hear about some of the successes that your organization has had with core diversity, equity, and inclusion work in your organization. I'd like for you to talk to me about some of the best practices that have really worked uh, for your uh, organization, such as employee resource groups or something that you're really proud of that you would like to leave with our audience today. 
uh, since I'm off mute, um, I'll start. Um, there are several things, yeah, there are several things that um, I'm very proud of. One is that our organization, our CEO, decided to take this journey because I do believe it starts from the top. Um, we, I'm proud that we have been able to hold ourselves accountable, not just in the diversity space, but diversity, inclusion, equity. We've um, established long-term goals that are aligned with our strategic business imperatives. So we have an inclusion goal, we have a workforce representation aspirational goal, and we have a health equity goal. Um, in the inclusion space, I'll say that we um, started off looking at a question on our employee satisfaction survey that said this organization values team members from different backgrounds. And we said in three years, we want it to be at the 90th percentile ranking and start at the 69th percentile ranking. We actually ended our three years in 2019 at the 95th percentile ranking. So um, we were really proud of that. We've closed some healthcare disparity gaps among blacks and whites related to pneumonia. We continue to work on our gaps in reflecting the workforce. Our business resource groups have also been very instrumental in helping us in our business and to understand our team members, our um, patients, and our communities at large. For example, our uh, Hispanic VRG actually helped to build our Novon Health website in Espanol. They went out and did focus groups and said, this is what the Latino population wants to see. It doesn't look as the same it is in English, so we transcreated it, not translated it. Um, for our, our website. Our African-American and Black BRG have really started a series called Leadership Speaks, where they invite leaders to talk with them every month about their own personal journey in diversity, inclusion, and equity, and their leadership journey. That has really given our leaders, our team members in the organization, an opportunity to, for one, to be um, exposed to senior leaders in the organization, and two, to be mentored. And I'd say at least 40% of our BRG leaders who've been in these BRG positions have been promoted throughout the company. So we're really excited about some of the work that the BRGs have done to help us be successful. Um, we have leadership development programs that we do for women. Called, one is called um, Leveraging Internal Female Talents, LIFT. We have a group for the next generation of leaders. So we've done a lot of things to retain, a lot of things to promote and to really develop people in the organization. Thank you so much for sharing that. And you know, just um, on that note, you mentioned in your comment um, and alluded to measurement. And I just wanna spend a few minutes on that because a lot of people say, well, diversity and inclusion has been around a long time. It's been around since the eighties, you know, and we're still in the same place and some of the DEI practitioners even talk about diversity 101. How do we know that it's making a difference? Does anyone, can anyone comment on some of the measurement um, tactics or the measurement strategies that you personally use in your work uh, to make sure that the program or the efforts that are going forth are working? Would any of you like to comment that? I see you shaking your head, Jim. Yeah, so I, I, I can comment on that. So um, so we do lots of measurements. I'm sorry, Mark. I'm sorry. Yeah, so um, uh, we've created dashboards for our leaders to look at, uh, you know, kind of how we're doing here. We've, we've made some really good progress uh, on our representation for women and minorities in general. But one of the things we've, we've discovered in looking at the information is that when you look at the aggregate information, it looks pretty good, but it's not until you disaggregate the information and look at the individual uh, minority populations in our company that we see we still have a, a whole lot of work to do. And so uh, we're starting to do that and we have some initiatives to really make some deliberate efforts with our um, historically black colleges and universities to go out and find those top candidates to bring into the laboratory. So um, that's the that's something that we've discovered with the measurements is you really have to disaggregate the information to really see what's going on and the aggregate information might give you a, a false sense of, um, of accomplishment. 
Oh, that's excellent. Excellent and very good advice. And uh, Jim, did I'm you gonna make, I was just going to make a comment to piggyback okay. off what you said. Yes. We okay. use something called, um, and as I said, we're in healthcare, so you, you will hear this, but you can use it in any area. Something called the real gaps analysis. And that's looking at our data um, by race, ethnicity, language, gender, age, payer, sexual orientation, gender identity. And you really, that really helps you to know where you want to focus your energies and where there are gaps. Because as Mark said, when you look at it just in aggregate, it really masks other things. So we do that routinely on our healthcare data. We look at it um, on our team member data, our engagement data, our patient satisfaction data. And it really helps us to know how to come up with interventions that we can implement throughout the system. Awesome, thank you so much. And Jen, did you have something to add? Sure, um, two things. One is um, what we find from many of our clients is that uh, some of the most important data about insiders, this whole idea that Susan was talking about, about insiders and outsiders is the outsiders frequently will leave the organization and upon exit interview, don't talk about why they're leaving. Because it's like, if you're not asking people about if they feel included until they're leaving, they're not gonna, there's not much motivation to talk about it. So churn or turnover as a result of not fitting in because the culture is too restrictive or confining, uh, we think is actually a huge factor that sometimes is uncaptured in data. Secondly, I'd say that, uh, and we hear this, again, this insider-outsider frame is interesting. Insiders frequently are saying, where's the data to support that we need to work on this? Or when are we going to be done with diversity and inclusion? When can we say we've accomplished it? You know, when we've, and of course, an outsider is going, you want, to, you want some data on, on diversity and inclusion? Let me tell you about my day at work today. Let me tell you about the 10 things that happened to me between home and getting to work. Let me tell you about the five things I had to tell my kids about that you don't have to talk about. I got data for you, but it's, sometimes it's anecdotal, it's in person, and you gotta be willing to listen. Thanks. Thank you, and that's, that's right on. Uh, anything else on that? Hey, I, gotta, I gotta comment on that. Okay. So Please. in the last, within the last two weeks, we've had a, a panel of our Black Leadership Committee um, talk about experiences that they've had with law enforcement. Um, some of them good experiences, but all of them had stories of maybe not so good experiences. And the really powerful thing was the ability for us all to hear from our colleagues, people that we work with, people that we respect, uh, technically competent people, leaders in our organization, and hear about their struggles, struggles that I've never had to deal with personally myself. Uh, in dealing with, they, all of them had a story. Very powerful. Mm -hmm. Very powerful, thank you so much. Now, I, I just wanna delve a little bit more into the core work of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in organizations. And I want us to think about the whole um, diversity, recruitment, and retention process. Uh, because some people um, are confused with those terms. Um, you know, what does diversity mean? I know that some people still are grappling with that whole idea of affirmative action, diversity, and uh, so forth. So I'd like to just sort of um, ask you, what are you seeing organizations, yours or others, doing uh, to really recruit, attract diverse candidates to their organization? And after they join that organization, what are, is being done to make sure that they're comfortable, that they feel welcome, that they belong, and uh, bottom line, that they stay? Um, can, can any of you comment on those, that aspect of diversity, equity, and inclusion work? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start with that one, um, Sandra. It's a complicated set of issues, but I'm going to try to simplify it. First of all, I think too many companies are spending a lot of effort on recruiting diverse talent. And they're not thinking about what's the experience of the culture that they're bringing people into. And so you tend to see um, women and underrepresented minorities leaving on a voluntary rate at a much higher percent than, than, than the dominant group of the white men. And, and so the, the issue is, 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 you know, yes, you can have lots of different strategies for how do you go find great diverse talent. I don't, I, there's a lot of great diverse talent out in the marketplace. 
But fundamentally, what we have to change is how leaders think about their role, not only in recruiting, but also in retention. And so what, what do I mean by that? The, the reality is, is that anytime any of us join a company, as you were saying, Jim, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of little moments all throughout the day, the moments of opportunity or missed opportunity, where I either feel included and valued, or I feel excluded and unvalued. And so my belief is, is that if you only focus on the recruiting piece of it, you're going to keep having people leave on the back end. And that's what I've seen over my 20 years is that a lot of the efforts on um, is on only the recruiting piece. That's not the whole equation, which then goes back to what do you have to do as an organization to create a very different experience for people coming in? And, and there are many things. First of all, I think there are a lot of things that aren't working. And unfortunately, I think they're not working. And I think it's one of the reasons why we've seen such small incremental changes in the majority of organizations. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, I was at a Society for Women Engineer event um, a few years back, 17,000 women engineers that were there at this large event. And up on stage, they had uh, white male leaders talking about partnership and allyship. And, and this was literally two years ago. This wasn't very long ago. And the facilitator asked a question to one of the executives, very senior executive at a, another, another company. And she said, you know, what's the, what's the value proposition of more women in engineering? And the guy's answer, you know, and he wasn't trying to be a jerk or anything. He was trying to say something that was appropriate. But his answer was, well, you know, when I was early in my career as an engineer, I looked around and I didn't see very many women. I thought, where are all the women? And he said, women in the workforce, you know, they're fun. And he just had this horrible answer about why women engineers could add value to the organization. The women in the audience, you know, however many thousands of women were in the audience, were sort of laughing like, oh, that's funny. The table that I was from, I wanted to get up on stage and strangle the guy for saying that because what was missing was the connection about his responsibility as a leader in the company to not just be an executive sponsor, to be a catalyst for change to be looking at every single decision that we're making in organizations and looking at it through the lens of an inclusive lens. And there's so many great practices out there. One practice that I learned along the way uh, is a practice that Catalyst talks about, which is understanding in your organization, what are your hot jobs? Hot jobs are the jobs that people get at all levels in the company that either make or break your career, highly visible jobs. And how are we making decisions about who, who goes in those jobs? Well, guess what? It's a lot of one-off decisions, generally by people who are in the insider group, who are choosing people like them going into the hot jobs, who are getting the opportunities to get the visibility with senior management. And so simply changing practices like, do we have an inclusive way of identifying potential talent to go into these roles? The number one reason people leave companies consistently is related to a perception of lack of development and career advancement. They feel like the opportunities are not there for them. And so fundamentally, from a retention standpoint, you can do as many focus groups as you want. You can do all kinds of different things, but fundamentally, what are all the little mini micro decisions that are getting made collectively across the organization that are resulting in no real change? And so the issue is, I mean, when we looked at this in a past company I worked for, decisions about who were going into some of these companies, being in interns, pipeline, the decisions were one-off decisions. There were like 21 placement opportunities that year. Of the 21 placement opportunities, not one was the woman or an underrepresented minority because the decisions were made by 21 different people that were in the insider group. And so then you say, we have, to, we have to change our processes. If yes. every single talent decision has to be looked through through the lens of inclusive leadership. And, and then it goes back to your other point about metrics. Metrics are key. It's got to be qualitative metrics and quantitative metrics. And I translate every single gap that we have. I break down every people of color category. I don't lump it together into a people category uh, section. We look at every single category of underrepresented minorities. We look across every single level we have in the company. And we create scorecards for our executives to say, here is your scorecard. And by the way, I know you care about this because this is not just a DNI strategy. This is a darn talent strategy. If you want the best people, we can calculate the loss of all these great people leaving because they don't like our culture. 
or they okay. think that it could be better somewhere else. Thank so. you so much. Those points are all well taken and I so appreciate your, your in-depth answers. Um, I do want to add to that, that it also matters how people feel on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it's, it's very important. Yes, it's the big picture and it's the big numbers, but bottom line, when people come to work, it's about the way that they feel. Do they feel like they're part of the culture? Do they feel like they belong? Do they yep. feel valued? It is a personal uh, experience. But I'd like to move real quickly because we're going to be transitioning to our Q&A very soon. Um, I just want to just set you take a moment to say that um, d and I work cannot stand still. It needs to move forward. It needs to reflect the reality of what's going on every day, not only in the lives of the organization, in the life of the organization, but also in the lives of people and in the lives of our community. So I'd like for everyone to just give me a comment on where do you think DNI e and i work is going? What does the future look like for DEI work now that a tsunami of impacts have uh, presented? How is DEI work changing and for the future? If you could just make a comment on that, I would appreciate it. We can start to transition into the Q and A portion. Anyone want to talk about the future? The fact that we're going to be having... I'll go after Susan. Boys. Susan Bunsen first, I'll go after Susan. <laughs> yeah, I feel, like I, I feel like I should stop talking because I could talk well, for hours on this topic. Let's just do this so that we can make sure everyone gets sure. a, a chance to talk. Let's make our comments at this point since we're rounding it out uh, to the Q&A section. Uh, we'll make some brief comments about okay. it. Okay. Briefly, what I think the future of the work looks like, deeply engaging the insider group as partners in the work, and that requires deep experiential learning to raise insight and understanding, do work that's research-based, and leverage data, qualitative and quantitative. Thank you. That's a very concise answer and loaded, loaded with action items. And Tanya? Yes, I would just build on what Susan said, and I would look at, also think our future is really looking at, um, I think we're talking more about systemic racism and injustices and inequalities, that work, and looking at the structures we put in place that intentionally or unintentionally exclude um, some and advantage others. I think to do a deep dive on that in companies is really important. We are in the middle of some of that work, but I, I in addition to what Susan said, I would add that the structures that include um, uh, unintentional or intentionally advantage um, some and disadvantage others. Thank you very much. That, that's, that's very right. And, and Mark and Jim, do you have anything to add to that? The future piece? Yeah, I do. I think definitely engaging the majority and dominant population is key. Um, and really, you know, recognizing this is a real opportunity to, to be a leader in this space. You know, it's an opportunity to be bold and to be brave and to be authentic and to demonstrate vulnerability and to really inspire your people to do the right thing. And there's a hunger for it now more than ever. Thank you. And, and Jim? Real quickly, I would say two things for the future. One is we, gotta, we really have to start integrating the work about shame into the work about inclusion, particularly for the insider group. Um, secondly, I think that, you know, if you look at what's happening in business schools in terms of the different curricula and how things are morphing, and also if you look at the, the leadership development matrices most organizations are using, inclusion is finally becoming a leadership skill that people are measuring, teaching, and trying to develop. And that's, to me, a critical part of the future. Yes, thank you so much. And, and just to keep in mind, that organizations, both logistically, uh, physically, are changing. A lot of work is gonna to continue to be done in a remote environment. And that is gonna challenge us as diversity professionals, as well as organizations, to make sure that the people who are part of the organization are uh, being respected and valued and feel belong. I think it's gonna really open up an opportunity for organizations to um, enact some new type of strategies 
uh, for diversity and inclusion. Now, I'd just like to, as we uh, start to transition into our Q&A section, uh, just one last statement from each of you. Uh, one last piece of advice would you give this dynamic audience that we have today uh, about diversity, equity, and inclusion? I open the floor. A brief comment. Yeah, I would say that um, it is important to acknowledge. I think sometimes we want to make things go, I, others uh, want to make things go away. So acknowledge when there's something wrong or there's an event or something is happening. And then listening to really truly seek understanding. Um, so often um, I find, and I've done this too, is that we will listen to make, the to make a response or to rationalize what has happened. The other is to take action, is that um, it's easy to wait until you get it perfectly, right? But it's more, I think it's more important to make progress and to take action. Um, and then the other thing I'd list is that all the work that we're doing in diversity, inclusion, equity really has to align with the strategic business imperatives in a company. And to make sure it's a part of the company, we've seen it as a culture change strategy, not a program. Um, I think sets diversity, inclusion, equity up for the future. Thank you. And Jim and Mark and Susan, do you have anything? Uh, last words of advice, Jim, please. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, real quickly, sorry. Um, I, I think the time you just said was brilliant. And um, to really just continue to look at how we open up the culture so that people can be successful in it. We don't, we don't necessarily need to throw everything away. Um, we do need to throw some things away, but we also need to think about the culture not as wrong or broken, but it's something that just needs to be expanded so more people can be successful in it. Thank you. And Mark, one last final word on- I think just a recognition that um, I don't have to wait for the company to do what's right. I can, I can take action myself and need to press forward myself to take action. Absolutely. And Susan, thank you. Yeah, just a final comment, that just to remember that the work in diversity, inclusion, and engagement is a talent opportunity. It's a performance enabler. It is an innovation enabler. And it is all about enabling the company to be more successful by keeping and bringing in the very best people. It's not something separate. It's all embedded in enabling the business by getting the best talented, most creative, innovative, diverse ways of thinking to solve business problems and leveraging the best of everybody and creating an environment where it brings out the best in everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, this has just absolutely been wonderful. And there are a number of questions that have come from the audience. Um, I'm going to um, ask the question and um, direct it to um, the appropriate person on the panel or persons. So um, this is a question from Mark and Tanya. How did each of your companies respond to um, shut down STEM? I don't know precisely what they're, where they're going with that. I'm not familiar with that term, shut down STEM. Not familiar with the term either. I'm not. Yeah, it's a hashtag actually. Um, I don't know whether they're, I don't know what they're talking about. So, you know what, let's move to the next one and maybe that'll become clearer. Um, uh, okay, so this is from Mark. Uh, chats of the nature Tanya mentioned seem like they could potentially be very challenging and painful. How do you avoid such dialogues going out of control? This is for Mark. Yeah, so that, that's a great question. So uh, as an organization, we've been at this for a little while. So we have, we've, we have created an environment where it's safe to have those conversations and our, and our executive leadership supports those conversations. And so that really helps. Plus, we have a, a minority population here at the laboratory that is willing to share their personal experiences and thoughts. That's not the case for everybody, but here we're fortunate enough to have that. And so had, have had some very rich dialogue and also just a recognition that we're, all, we're each of us are at a different point on the journey 
and we have to give each each other grace to recognize it's not going to we're not going to get it right right we're not going it's not going to be right all the time so give ourselves some grace to to make the mistakes and as long as our hearts in the right place it should work out fine great thank you so much mark now this question i'm going to throw out to everyone on the panel um, uh, one of our participants is asking what do you say to those who are completely against the open conversations and want to dispute that white privilege does not exist. What do you say to those who have those feelings? <laughs> I see uh, some smiles. Okay. Well, can you can you restate the question one more time, Sandra? Just what was the first part of the question? What do you say to those who are completely against having the open conversations and want to dispute? that white privilege doesn't exist? Uh, I'll go. Uh, okay. First thing is to tell, yeah. I would say, tell me more. It, uh, to tell, say, tell me more. If we're gonna do, do inclusion, we gotta be willing to really listen to the people who maybe aren't for it or don't understand it so we can see where they're coming from. Too often, I'll just talk, talk for myself, when I hear those kind of, when I hear people taking that stance, I wanna argue them out of it. And um, if I'm really going to do inclusion, I got to be willing to listen to their answers fully, because usually there's something behind whatever the resistance is. So uh, this is an unpopular stance, truthfully, for a lot of folks, but you got to listen to the people who you don't agree with sometimes, and that's hard. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave it to others to also comment. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with Jim, and I've had a lot of those conversations. And I think when you're going to have dialogue or conversations about when someone's thinking differently than you, um, you have to have an intention for that dialogue. You know, when I go in to have the dialogue, it's not about trying to change someone else's mind. It's really seeking to understand where they're coming from and sharing the perspective of where I'm coming from and where the organization is coming from. So I think um, you have to really step into it. Um, resistance sometimes feels bad, but it really is good. If there's no resistance in the organization, that tells me you're not doing a whole lot. So I'd say lean into the resistance and really seek to understand their perspective. So I'm piggybacking off of Jen. Thank you. Anyone else on that question? Yeah, I would just answer uh, one additional piece too. Normally there's a resistance to even being involved in it. It's more like that's somebody else's work. And that's where I remind them that this is a talent opportunity and that's every business leader's responsibility. And then the piece on, on privilege, because it can be a sensitive topic, is this is where I've learned so much from White Men as Full Diversity Partners with some of their um, amazingly designed experiential processes to help elevate and deepen the understanding that privilege is real. And it's done in a very productive, healthy way. And um, I have seen it shift teams and you know people are all on a different journey uh different places along this journey but i would say get some support from some outside experts white male diversity partner okay thank you experiential thank you uh moving to another question and i just will remind you all that there's a lot of questions <laughs> uh, so i bet you every last one of you are going to have a full opportunity um but there's this is a question um, that is asking, for example, I wonder if anyone could address the notion that the default human is white and mostly male, and then gives the example that so much of advertising and company messaging is white male shaped. And this is reinforced by the choice of stock photos and iconography and much of the imagery supporting the message. So in other words, mm. a lot of the advertising, a lot of the forward face for companies is white males. Any comment? I can, I can start off with one comment pretty quickly is, it, but by the nature of our firm, by the nature of the name of our firm, sometimes we get attention, it's like, well, why are you centering white men in the conversation around diversity and inclusion? Isn't the goal, at least in the United States, to really center the work on uh, people who are part of ethnic, racial, or other minority groups who don't get as much attention or support? 
and we would go, yes, and that, that is the, the, the purpose of our, our work, but and we're not trying to center white men, we're trying to include them. So uh, yeah, one of the things that we just noticed about this, this idea of privilege, and I would say even about white supremacy, is it's part of what, we, what our children are exposed to that kind of gets baked into the way that we think about things. So what color is a, what color is a Band-Aid, for example? What's it say on the box? What color is a Band-Aid? Flesh colored. Well, is it really flesh colored, Tanya? Right? So it, some band-aids aren't, it, we just make all these assumptions and it becomes really part of the, part of the hard drive of how we think and how we behave. And to us, some of the work that's available to not just white people, but everybody is to notice the messages that those exact things uh, bring into our consciousness that become part of our operating system. And before we even know it, we're operating from a place of unconscious bias uh, and lack of awareness, so. Yes, and I mean, I, I can comment on that from my own perspective. I just really believe that companies need to be sensitive about their audience, their, their customer base, their community. And I believe that companies should work very hard to reflect the makeup of their uh, their customer base and their communities. So that would mean that there would be a fully diverse advertisements uh, and outreach uh, uh, from a, the truest sense. Uh, you were going to comment also, Tanya. Yeah, I was just going to. I totally agree with you, and I think that's where we have to use our voice influence to raise the question. Sometimes it's hard to say, but did you look at that? Did you look at that advertisement? There's no one that looks at looks like me in that advertisement. It doesn't reflect our communities. Um, but I think we have to raise the question and use our voices in that. We've come a long way in our organization for doing that, but it took it's taken years to get us to that um, to naturally thinking that way. Um, that wasn't the way that we thought all along. So I think it's a, it's a journey and you have to raise your voice and use whatever influence you have to raise the questions. If you don't raise the question or the concern, it, it may go unnoticed. Mm -hmm. That's true. And, and one other thing that we might think about is I think about it as a diversity lens. And uh, that's why I advocate for uh, the diversity lens to be present at all levels in the organization when decisions are being made, uh, just to raise that flag and say we need to have more diversity in this advertisement or we're lacking diversity in this spot. So another question that's coming forward is um, this is going to go out to Mark again and it says I guess Mark did you use the term desegregate? And if you did, what does that mean? Disaggregate. Disaggregate, I'm sorry. Disaggregate, yeah. It was me seeing it, uh, not seeing it clearly. Yeah. And so can you just explain a little bit about um, that word? Yeah, so that was in reference to, um, you know, we've made progress relative to uh, our female representation at the lab and our minority representation at the lab, but it's aggregated data. So in order to really see what's going on, you have to separate the data out into the different populations that you're, that you're interested in, right? So otherwise it's gonna be masked by uh, the overall numbers. I see. It's, it's aggregated. Yes, thank you. Uh, another question that goes out to the whole panel, um, how are your companies reaching out to the communities of color. Many communities of color are unaware of jobs available at your companies. So if anyone would like to just expound a little bit on how your uh, organizations involve uh, the communities uh, within which they sit uh, or they draw from for their customer base, any comments on that? I'm, I'm happy to comment. So uh, here in particular, we care very deeply about how we show up in the community and whether we're good neighbors in the community. And so this is, this is an area where we really um, leverage our employee resource groups to um, engage with the, with the, 
the different populations in the community to really reach out and then support those groups in doing so. So that's what, that's what we do here. Uh, we have a very, very active community engagement program and a very strong volunteer um, mentality here with our, with our personnel. Thank you very much. Does anyone else in the panel want to comment on that? That would be community engagement um, process. Um, I, I can, yes, okay. is it, Susan was first. That's all you come up okay. with. Okay. That's okay. Susan. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I have something black in my screen. So Susan, please go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Yeah, the only thing I would add is we've got uh, locations all over the, the world, literally. And so our local HR teams working with local leadership um, make many, many steps in partnership with the community. I won't go into a lot of details, but there's a, it's a localized approach on behalf of global um, opportunities. Okay, very good. And also- Similar to, go ahead. Similar to Mark, we, all, we utilize our business resource groups to help us recruit talent. And our HR department does a great job of going to the local community and doing job fairs in the communities. Um, I do want to add too on our, we have a talent assessment that we, that um, candidates complete when they're applying for a job. And initially that talent assessment was only in English. I'm happy to say today, we've now put that assessment in seven languages. Because what we found is that if you speak, a, if English isn't your primary language, then when you do the assessment, you read it in English, translate it in your head, and then try to answer it in English, translate it in your head in your native language, and try to answer it in English. So we've really gone to seven languages. And in our job just postings, we talk about our philosophy of diversity and inclusion and equity. So that's really clear when people are interviewing. And um, in our job um, positions uh, questionnaires, we actually have in there, we prefer someone who's bilingual. So we're trying to always to let people know that um, we are open and we have an inclusive um, and welcoming environment for them to, for which they can work. Okay. The other thing I would add, I just want to add one more thing because it's relevant. Sure. It's not, not just looking about getting a diverse slate of candidates, but we're also shifting to creating diverse interview teams so that we have a good, broad, diverse perspective on the candidates that we're interviewing. Very good. Excellent. Thank you. Um, this question is interesting because, um, yes, we have experienced a lot of uh, change in the past couple of months, but there's been a um, existing uh, problem or uh, at least a perceived one uh, in terms of equity in organizations um, among marginalized groups and women. Uh, this question says, how will your companies correct the disparities of people in the workforce, um, as well as the dollar, the, not the, the actually I'm gonna say salaries of people of color um, that there's um, known to be historical uh, discrepancies in that regard. So can anyone comment on uh, what they're doing within their organizations to ensure uh, that people are being um, compensated in an equity equitable basis? Uh, I can tell you that we, um, at least annually, and if there's something that bubbles up before then, we look at all of our job categories and look at how people are being paid. We also implemented a living minimum living wage. So we have a certain dollar amount that no one makes less than that dollar amount in our company. And um, each year, the last couple of years, I will say that it's gone up um, the last couple of years because we realize that people need to be at a certain dollar amount to have basic living needs met. So we evaluate it and we continue to look at the living wage, the minimum living wage that people need to have. Thank you, Tanya. Um, does anyone else want to respond to that? Um, the equity piece? Okay, I agree with what you're saying, Tanya. I recommend all the organizations that I work with to have a clear picture of what their organization looks like in terms of equity. It is essential. And I've noticed that a lot of DNI practitioners have added that equity piece to even the uh, title diversity and inclusion. It's now diversity, equity, and inclusion. And people recognize that that is essential. It's essential for people to feel valued in that way. 
So it, that's a very fair question that was asked and it's something that we should all pay attention to. Now I'm gonna ask another question and this is gonna uh, coming uh, from the audience. Do you feel that significant progress has been made in breaking down fears concerning the inclusion of black men in senior corporate functions? Often this person has observed inclusion efforts are targeting women singularly as the solution. So this is a question that's going to embrace the inclusion of black men. How would you respond to that, panelists? I would say that um, I think more work needs to be done in our organization as well. And when you look at the number of black male leaders in our organization, I think we have an opportunity um, to increase the number um, of talented individuals in our organization. We do have, um, as I mentioned, the business resource groups that are really helping us to look at that, to look at all the populations as well as black males um, in the organization. But I do think there is an opportunity um, to continue the work in that space. Thank you. Uh, Sandra, I would, yeah, I would add to that, um, to what, what Tony said is, I think there's, there, that's a, it's, a, it's a really good question, and it's not one that can be easily talked about in three minutes or less. But there's an element of white male culture that has to do with rank and status and power. And um, I, if we were to really get honest, I think that white men have, in the United States have had a sense of authority and power and control for a long time. And when it's challenged or when all of a sudden their competency is compared with other people's competencies who may be different than them. I think sometimes we, we, uh, we fall back on stereotypes that are really, really baked into us that are 500 years old. And we've got to really be willing to take a look at them and examine what's going on and, 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 and how we, want, we might need to shift the power structure and hierarchy or our sense of power structure and hierarchy and organizations to be more inclusive. And that's very, very, very close to the bone, I think, for a lot of white male leaders. Yes. So. Thank you. Thank you for that very candid response. I appreciate it. Uh, from my perspective, it is definitely going to take introspection and self-examination, self-awareness, um, and also very hard work for organizations to um, uh, overcome some of those uh, fears. And it was interesting that the question even used that word, fear. Now I'm gonna move into something earlier in our conversation, we talked about the introspective and personal self-reflective work that we all need to do um, as we work in this space. And this particular question comes from a participant who asked, I'm curious about what conversations the panel has had with their children about George Floyd's situation. So this is a very personal, uh, question. I think it's appropriate because we are working in a very emotional environment right now. But do any of you feel that you can share that, uh, how you've had conversations, if not with your children, with your family, about George Floyd? Yes, I can. I have um, actually a son and daughter, and they are both adults. And when they were over one weekend, we had a lot of conversation about what that was like for um, African Americans. And we talked a lot with my son on experiences he has had with the police. And, you know, I, I, am, I get, I can get emotional about this. I get very fearful anytime my children are out because I'm afraid they're great children, adults, um, but I get afraid that something could happen to them um, with the police. And so my son talked about um, a couple of times that he had been stopped one time I didn't know about, but another time he had been stopped for something about the shading on his car. And so what he did at that time, um, he was living in Virginia then, he lives here in North Carolina now. He actually called me on the phone because I think he was nervous. Um, this has been a couple of years ago. And so we stayed on the phone the entire time until the policeman said, okay, you can go. So yes, we talked about it being um, unfair. We talked about how 
scary it is, how emotional it is to even think about because of the color of your skin that you could be harmed. And we, t we talk about safety and um, we talk about things to do when you're safe. Like one of those was to call me. So um, we've talked at length about it with Thank both you. my son and my daughter. Thank you very much. Does anyone else want to share um, how the conversations that they may have had with their families, their children, um, their mates about what happened when George Floyd died? Yeah, so I, I can I can comment about it. So okay. thank you. I, I think it's you know it's an illustration. Uh, it's getting harder and harder and harder to deny the inequities that we've got in in our society here and. Uh, and so, and this is where the whole, you know, where it becomes important to assert that black lives do matter because what you see and what's going on uh, might lead you to conclude that they don't matter, right? So it's, I think that's what makes it so important to assert that black lives do matter. And when we talk with our family about it and they say, well, you know, don't all lives matter? Um, you know, what we basically say is, look, we, you know, this is, Contrary to what you see, this is an assertion that it does matter, that black lives do matter. And like when I, when I say, I love my son, I don't see everybody gasp and say, oh, you mean you don't love your daughter? Excellent analogy, thank you. That's great. And I know for myself, um, with the killing of George Floyd, I personally did a lot of reflection and I saw a whole panorama of experiences that just flowed before me um, when that happened and a lot of reflection, a lot of conversations. And I encourage everyone, all the panelists and even the participants to do the same. Any other comments? Yeah, I'll, I have one real quickly. I am um, a, a young you. man that works for me. Um, uh, is in a, He's a white guy and he's in a mixed race marriage and he has a, a black daughter and um, uh, I, I don't know how to talk about this without getting emotional, but he, uh, she was watching, she's seven, and she was watching the news, and it was one of those moments where mom and dad hadn't necessarily filtered what was on television as well as they wanted to, and she ended up watching the, the, eight, the eight minutes and 43 seconds of the George Floyd video, and he called me, and he was so stirred up. He was like, I just had to explain to my daughter what she just saw on television. And that, you know, I mean, I know about the talk that, that people of color have to give to their kids that I don't have to give to my kids. But when he was telling me about that, I went, it was like a spear through my heart. It was like, oh, my God, you know, to have to actually curate what's on, on network news because it's, you know, it's R-rated horror um, just beyond. So. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Uh, have I gotten everybody on that comment? Yeah, I just wanted to add my perspective on it. I, I'm sitting here and I feel, I actually feel very emotional as well. I, I have two sons and, you know, much like the country right now, there's just polarization, polarization on many topics, including this important topic. And, um, you know, we've, we've had very open discussions. They have very different views. And, um, and even with friends who have very different views, I, I, I just, I find it, I just find it shocking that, that there are people who have beliefs that are, are de minimizing or diminishing the impact of, of what happened. And so I, I continue the dialogues, continue it. You try to make space for different opinions and views because there are different opinions and views, but do everything I can to try to, to influence my perspective on it, which is, um, which is what I've already shared. So it's been an emotional, it's an emotional journey. Yes, it is a very emotional journey. And there are a lot of other questions that unfortunately our time is not going to allow us to get to. Uh, but I, this, this is my, what I would like to say to everyone, this conversation has to continue. It has to continue both on a personal basis as well as on an organizational basis. And um, I, I want to thank all of my panelists again for serving. Uh, this is a very worthwhile way to spend um, an hour and a half. Uh, I'm very, very uh, moved 
that you all uh, are participating today and speaking from your heart. So I wanna thank you very much for, for being a part of this panel today. I, I appreciate it and I'm sure that everyone, color uh, appreciates it as well. Um, at this time, I am going to turn it back over to Evan, who is going to um, do a closure for us. Thank you very much. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Casey Buford. Uh, your moderating uh, was fantastic. And thank you again to all of our panelists for your very uh, heartfelt and thoughtful responses uh, to the questions posed both by Dr. Buford and by our audience members. Um, I would like to invite everyone, as you can see on the screen, to follow Color on social media. Um, it is our mission to encourage and facilitate these dialogues. So please, you know, if you have uh, more questions, more thoughts, just want to share your experience, follow us on social media and, and tell us what you think. Um, we also uh, would invite you to <clears throat> follow uh, White Men as Full Diversity Partners on their social media uh, to make sure that you can stay abreast of uh, the work that they're doing in their, in their organization. Um, and with that, I would like to turn it back to Camilla to begin our final closing remarks. Wow, what a powerful discussion. I think there's so many topics that, uh, again, an hour, you know, or an hour and a half is just not enough. I wanna thank all of you for attending this morning and I hope you found some value from this conversation. I know one takeaway that, uh, that um, was shared was just company having a personal commitment to stand up against racial injustice. And I think that reflects it all um, and, and much of the conversation. So. Thank you again. Thank you to our, our, our panelists. Thank you, WMFDP. Um, in our follow-up from this event, we are conducting a short survey that we hope you'll complete. Um, this will help us learn more about you and what your company is doing in areas of DNI, and that will help us shape our future programming. So when you see that, we would really appreciate if you do um, take a minute and give us your thoughts. Color has some exciting new virtual events on the horizon, including our Chief Diversity Officer Roundtables, our Black Wealth Series, our Women in STEM Career Summit, and we also are celebrating our 10th anniversary of our Women of Color Leadership and Empowerment Conference. So this 2020 has offered um, us all a number of challenges, but I, I like how many of the panelists has, has used this word. It's also given us opportunities. So um, we're taking this time to use those opportunities. Um, and we're also launching a digital newsletter. So um, if, if you get that in your email, please you know, take a look, give us some feedback. Uh, we'd love to get um, your thoughts on that. So please, again, follow us on our website and our social media to learn more. Color wants to thank you once again. I'd like, like to bring Jim back to the virtual stage for some closing words um, with WMFDP. Thank you so much. Camilla, thank you very much. I don't have much to add except to just to restate what you and Evan stated is please follow us at, uh, you know, to check out our website at WMFDP.com. Stay connected to our free resources and uh, other upcoming webinars that are to help in this extraordinary time to provide support for those who need it. And also connect to us through our podcast, the Insider Outsider podcast, which is available through your preferred streaming provider. And, um, and wonderful, wonderful time. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Stay Thank safe. You. Stay healthy. Take good care. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good job, Mark.